The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. I saw my dad, you know, banging my mom's head off one wall and off another, and I could hear her crying, and I felt so guilty. You know, my dad, as you probably remember, ended up in a psych hospital where he would go on to take his own life. But you know, I blamed myself for that for almost 30 years. Sheila Walsh explores the question, where was God, as we spend Wednesdays in the Word, next. Hi, I'm Sheila Walsh, and I just want to say welcome to Wednesdays in the Word. I really appreciate the fact that so many of you drop me little notes and you'll talk about things that have really touched you or share a story. And I also love it when I'm out on the road and I get to meet some of you uh, face to face and talk about your life. And, and so often it's from those conversations that I think, you know, Lord, I think it'd be good to do a show to talk about these things. And one of the conversations that really stuck with me recently, I was talking to a young girl whose father had recently died. And her question was, where was God when that happened? You know, my dad's always told me, A, that God loves us, and B, that God answers prayer. So where was he? We were all around his bed praying. And I think that's something that, if we're honest, many of us have asked from time to time when we're hurting. So I want us to look at, at that today. I was even reading through some of your letters recently and I saw the same theme. Where was God when this happened? And it's so clear to me in our culture, there's so much pain, so much loneliness. And if we're honest, you know, many questions that we sometimes think, well, I can't even ask that. It doesn't sound very spiritual. And there's some things I have learned so far in my journey. You know, I gave my life to Christ when I was 11. I'm now 61. That's 50 years of the absolute glorious, perfect faithfulness of God. So I wanted to share a couple of things I've learned I would stake my life on. And one of them is this. No matter how alone you feel, no matter how much you're struggling, I want you to know this. God sees your pain. You know, one of the memories from my childhood was a strange one. It was watching something terrible happen, but through the keyhole in a door. It was when my dad's mental illness reached its peak and he became very violent one day. You know, in the, in the days and weeks before, his outbursts of anger were much smaller things. You know, he'd, he'd pull my hair or he'd spit in my face and it, he always did it when my mom was out of the room and I never told her because I loved my dad so much and I didn't understand why he was doing these things and as a five-year-old girl I thought it's my fault I just have to try harder you know my, my dad had lost the ability to speak so I thought I'm just making him mad I have to try harder but no matter how hard I tried it wasn't ever enough but on that last day, I knew, even as a child, I was in the fight for my life. My mom was in the kitchen and when she heard my screams, she came in and she grabbed my sister and my brother and me and she locked us in a room while she dialed 911. Well, she must have taken the key with her and put it in her pocket because I remember looking through the keyhole and all I could see was what was visible through that small space. I saw my dad, you know, banging my mom's head off one wall and off another, and I could hear her crying, and I felt so guilty. You know, my dad, as you probably remember, ended up in a psych hospital where he would go on to take his own life. But you know, I blamed myself for that for almost 30 years. When hard things happen to us as children, we always think there was something we did to cause it, or we weren't enough, or we were a disappointment. And I wonder what you've had to carry in your life. For some of you, it's that absolutely abhorrent evil against a child of sexual abuse. Or maybe it was physical abuse like me. Sometimes it can just simply be 
unkind words that leave a scar on your soul. And if you, even now, as you're watching this program, if you're in pain, if you feel alone, if you think that God has forgotten you, I want you to read you some promises, not from me, but from the infallible, stake your life on it, word of God. We read this. But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you, O Israel, the one who formed you, says, do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. When you go through, not if, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. Now, you might be tempted to think, well, come on, Sheila, that's the Old Testament. Those were promises made just for Israel. Well, let me remind you of what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He said this, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. So many promises, yes, were made in the Old Testament. But when Christ came, God in human flesh, all of those promises were yes in him for you and for me. If your heart is broken, the psalmist David wrote these true beautiful words. Psalm 34, one of my favorite verses said, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. God's not far away when you're hurting. He is right here. And if you are in pain, if you are struggling, I would really encourage you to find a quiet place. You know, we live in such a noisy world. We're so attached to our phones or to the television or all the stuff that we think we need to know. But there's something beautiful when you pull away from all of that and just sit in the Lord's presence. Not just with a, a list of prayers, although he welcomes those, but allow yourself time to sit and listen. Remember what it says? Be still and know that I am God. Find a place where you can be still. Well, another thing that I know for sure because he has done it for me is this. He removes our shame. Lewis Smedes is a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary where I went, and he def defines shame this way, a vague undefined heaviness that presses on our spirit, dampens our gratitude for the goodness of life and slackens the free flow of joy. Shame seeps into and discolors all our other feelings, primarily about ourselves, but about almost everyone and everything else in our life as well. Shame has weight to it. It bows us down. It tells us you'll never be enough. Shame alienates you from God, from other people, and even, even from yourself, your true self. Now, sometimes we carry shame because of things that we have done. I read the following statement from a prisoner, an inmate who is still incarcerated, and this is what she wrote about her shame. I could hide my sins from everyone but myself. No physical torment can match the torments of an accusing conscience. An accusing conscience means hell on earth. No earthly wealth, human love, music, fun, or intoxication can dispel or comfort the agony of its gnawing teeth. My sins were finding me out. I was suffering for every sin I'd ever committed. Sin was breeding a moral ulcer. A deceased character 
is worse than the deceased body. My character was suffering. I could not escape my sin. You know, I've always said, because it's been my experience, that, that guilt tells us we've done something wrong, but shame tells us we are something wrong. But as I read some of these statements from these various incarcerated prisoners, I realized, no, sometimes shame is because of things that we have done that we can't undo. And if that is you, I want you to know, when you come to Christ and you ask for forgiveness, when you own your sin, you don't try and hide it, you don't brush it under the carpet, but you own it. Scripture tells us, not just that he forgives our sin, he removes it as far as the east is from the west and he remembers it no more. But that's not always the case. Often the shame we carry isn't because of something we've done, it's because of who we think we are. In some ways, I think that's worse because what can you do? You know, if you've done something wrong and you're filled with shame, you can try and rectify that. But if you feel you are something wrong, where do you go? So many of the careless words that are spoken to us leave deep wounds. I mean, if you were told as a child that you're stupid, you know, that sticks and it becomes part of who you believe yourself to be. If you've been told, you know, you're a loser, you can never amount to anything, or you weren't wanted, those words cut deep. It's one of the things that I learned in the early years of my marriage, because, you know, sometimes I can be a little quick back then I'd be a little quick with things that I thought were funny or a little sarcastic but my husband sat me down one day and he said you know when you say things like that it really wounds me I, mean, I had to really ask my husband to forgive me and to be careful for every word that comes out of my mouth because when you think about it, everything we do is either cursing or blessing and it doesn't have to be some great, oh, I curse you. It can be a roll of your eyes. Just our attitude, our inner attitude. That this one of the things I'm really asking God and the Holy Spirit to work with me on so that everything that comes out of my mouth would be a blessing and not a curse. And the church, when you think about it, the church should be the place where we get to show up as we really are and be loved back to life. But often it's the place where we hide our true selves. You know, I gave my life to Christ at 11. I went to seminary. I sang at Billy Graham Crusades. I co-hosted the 700 Club for five years. But inside, all that time, I was still the same shame-filled little girl who wouldn't let anyone get close to her in case she saw what my dad saw. My shame kept me safe, but it kept me alone. I remember one day in the psych hospital, we had all sorts of different group sessions and I was sent to, it was like an art session, but it was po with pottery. And the teacher gave me a piece of clay and said, you know, mold something that represents your life. And I remember thinking, that just doesn't make any sense to me. I can't do that. I mean, I remember once in school, I drew what I thought was a magnificent Arabian stallion and my teacher asked me why I put a saddle on a lizard. So it's not my gift. But the teacher said to me, listen, Sheila, you think too much, just do it. But when I'd finished, I was horrified, honestly, by what I'd done. What I'd done, I'd made a, like a, a little circle with very high walls. And inside, there was a little stick figure with long arms so that she could reach over the wall and touch you. But nobody got back into her. But here's what I know now. Christ is in the shame erasing business. Jesus is anti-shame. I mean, we see all through scripture. You know, remember, we've talked about this before, but remember the, the story of the woman at the well? You know, she's absolutely shamed. She's full of shame. She goes out to get water at the hottest part of the day so she won't have to face those accusing eyes. Married five times, now living with a guy that's not even her husband. But then she has this encounter with Christ. 
And one of the things I've always thought was interesting about the story is Jesus shares all this good news with her, you know, that um, I'm going to give you water and you'll never thirst again. And then he asks that question, go and get your husband, you know? And it was just like the other shoe fell. Because in the first century, there was no limit to the number of times you could marry after a divorce. However, the rabbis regarded three marriages to be the maximum for a woman. So she had gone too far. And I wonder about you. Have you ever felt you've just gone too far? Well, Jesus talked to her. And after he told her that there's water that he can give, that she'll never be thirsty again. And then he goes on to ask her this question, you know, go get your husband. So what's she going to do? But have you ever asked yourself, why did Jesus do that? You know, is he trying to add to her shame? No. Think of whatever is going on in your life right now. The things that maybe you've never told anybody else. You know, maybe you have these secrets or, or maybe you had an affair or maybe something, maybe you had an abortion and nobody else knows. And if Christ sat down with you and told you exactly that, what would that do to you? See, it's actually the most glorious news because unless we understand that Jesus knows the worst there is to know, we'll never believe the best he has for us. What are you holding back from Jesus? What are the things that make you feel that you are unlovable? You know, where does your shame lie? Jesus wants to take it from you just as he did for that woman at the well. You know, the immediate evidence that Christ had removed her shame is that she ran back to the village, to the very people she's been hiding from and said, come and meet the man who told me everything I've ever done. When Christ removed her shame, she became the first evangelist to her village. That's what it does. When Christ removes your shame, you are transformed and you want everyone else to know. One of my favorite um, verses in the Psalms is this, Psalm 34, 5, says, those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. The Passion Translation puts it this way. I think it's beautiful. Gaze upon him. Join your life with his and joy will come. Your faces will glisten with glory. You'll never wear that shame face again. How beautiful is that? Do you ever find that, you know, you've known a scripture for years and you never really understood it until you desperately needed it? Well, I remember that when I read Matthew chapter 11, the last couple of verses, where Jesus says, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I really encourage you, whether you're 14 or 84, find a place, a quiet place, where you can tell God the whole truth. That's what Jesus told this woman worship was in spirit and in truth, meaning with nothing hidden. You don't have to hide anymore. You get to actually show up because you're loved as you are, not as you wish you were, not as you wish your childhood has been, but right now you are loved. And we are gonna get to share that love with some people who are looking for something that you and I take for granted but they've never had in their lives. I think this is one of my favorite campaigns that we do throughout the year. It's, it's a joy, it's easy to do, but in so many circumstances we also see it's not just a pair of shoes, it's sometimes it's literally the difference between life and death. Because so many of these children, because they've never worn shoes in their life and they're not walking on nice sidewalks, they're walking on rough ground where their feet get cut. And when they get cuts on their feet or they're in this dirty water and they end up with hookworm that can go to the brain and do damage there. So many of these children, their very lives are threatened simply for the lack of a pair of shoes. 
But we have come up with this amazing solution. These darling little shoes. Do you know what we're able to send these for? One pair is $3.60. I mean, what can you get for $3.60? You can't even get one of those fancy coffee drinks. But this could bring life to a child. And we call it shoes and smiles because we want to go a little further. Some children are born with just terrible cleft lip and palate. That's a very expensive surgery normally, but we work with some doctors who've said, listen, we will do this on a child for $500. So would you go to your phone, make the very best gift possible, go online, and let's change the lives of these little ones in Jesus' name. Poverty is a killer, and because of it, children needlessly suffer not only from a lack of food and clean water, but also from a lack of things we often take for granted, like a simple pair of shoes. Far too many children living in extreme poverty have never owned a new pair of shoes. And while that may seem minor in the light of all their needs, walking with bare feet puts them at risk of life-threatening infections and disease that could lead to crippling consequences and even death. By responding today, you can help immediately secure and begin shipping Christmas shoes to 150,000 children around the world, and for many, just in time for the holidays. Your gift of $36 will help provide 10 pairs of shoes, a gift of $72 will help provide 20 pair, and a gift of $180 will help provide 50 pairs of Christmas shoes for children in need. As a thank you for your gift of support, be sure to request this beautifully crafted red crystal shoe ornament a treasure to display at each Christmas. With your gift of $100 or more, you may request a Light Shines in Darkness Frosted Glass Candle featuring a beautiful golden design with scripture from John 1.5. Finally, please consider a gift of $1,000 or more to help provide 275 pairs of shoes or two children with corrective cleft palate surgeries. And you may request the Bridge of Faith Canvas Print by Thomas Kincaid. Please call, write, or make your gift online today. I think it'd be so glorious if we reclaimed Christmas for Christ. And it was not just about giving and giving and getting for ourselves, but rather it was giving to those who genuinely have a need. Can you imagine the eyes of those children the very first morning, Christmas morning, they get a pair of shoes and you and I can do it. Thank you so much for being with me. I'll see you next time on Wednesdays in the Word.
Are you concerned about keeping your family well equipped to manage your resources when you pass away and leaving a lasting legacy? Contact Life Planning Services today. And I used to think I suffered from attention deficit, uh, but I realized I don't suffer from it at all. It's the people around me that seem to have a problem with it. I... Tomorrow. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.